Welcome back to episode seven of the Eric Z podcast. I'm your host, Eric Zamora. A little bit about myself. I'm a full-time realtor with Rennie and Associates Realty. So over at Rennie, we have our brokerage side as well as our project marketing side. So we assist various developments throughout BC, Alberta, even the United States. And um, special mention also to our intelligence uh, division. So our intelligence division has our uh, in-house economists. Um, they work around the clock to analyze data and they put it together in these amazing reports that are easy to understand and to help you as a consumer to make the most informed decision when buying and selling real estate. Today, we have very special guests, the other half of the Villani Zamora group. Shelly Villani, thank you for being here. Thank you so much for having me. Finally in the hot seat. <laughs> so we have a lot to talk about today. Um, I always like to start off to really, really get to know, um, you know, who is Shelly Villani? Um, you have this amazing, successful career in real estate, but what were you doing before all of this in your personal, professional life? Where did you grow up and so on? Okay. Well, I grew up in North Burnaby, uh, born and raised, and still living in North Burnaby in uh, the amazing Brentwood area. And um, before real estate, I actually did a lot of things. <laughs> I used to be a recruiter. Um, I went to BCIT for business um, and marketing. And um, after I got my degree, I wasn't sure what I wanted to do, but I know I wanted to do something big. So I um, wanted, to, I loved makeup and skincare. And so I wanted to launch my own skincare line. And so I researched it, I looked uh, into it, and I found chemists in um, New York and San Diego that could make the products and packaging overseas. Um, it was a huge financial, it was very financially heavy for me to do this. I had to have two different jobs. Uh, I did the recruiting um, and I did some kind of eBay selling on the side um, to support that business. And um, I realized it was it was quite difficult. I couldn't do a whole skincare line, so I decided just to do a lip plumper. Um, and so I did that, got everything shipped to my house, um, probably 10,000 lip plumpers, and now I had to sell the products. And um, when I went to different stores, different boutiques, it was hard to get in. I had to pay for shelf space. I didn't realize that. I was in my 20s, over my head, thinking I could do all of this, and um, I did. I still I continued with it for two years to try to get, you know, get these products into the um, shelves and um, mm -hmm. sold. Um, so it took actually three years to get everything sold, um, but I had to discount it heavily in the last couple of years because it just it it, it was going to expire, and. Um, and it was come. It came to a point where I'm like, I gotta change careers. I gotta do something else. I, I'm not able to support this anymore. Um, at the same time, I also worked at. I got a job to work at a tanning salon. Um, I became the regional manager of that salon. Um, they had five salons in the Lower Mainland, and um, I worked there for three years. And I realized, I'm like, you know what? I could open my own tanning salon. I, you wow. know, worked with the staff. Um, I did most of the marketing um, as a seller with all the products that were there and taught, trained um, all the reps at the other salons how to sell these products and how to up the volume of the business. And I was so heavily involved that I'm like, you know what, I have the confidence to do my own tanning salon. So I found a space in North Burnaby right on Hastings and Hold'em. Um, it was called uh, the Tanning Zone. And um, I changed the name to Sun City Tanning, um, you know, up the machines, changed all the bulbs, refreshed everything, hired new staff and, um, wow. you know, took everything I learned from the previous business and made it my own. We became um, number one tanning salon for six years in North Burnaby. So it was very, you know, nice. in my heart, very successful, but financially not successful. <laughs> it wasn't as lucrative as I wanted it to be. And um, the goal for me was to, you know, do these businesses so that I could have financial freedom, get my own dream home and, you know, 
live that life that I wanted for myself and it just wasn't happening. And so, uh, and you know, as the years went by, I realized the numbers weren't making sense. And so that business then closed. I had to sell that business and actually decided to take the leap to do, uh, use everything I learned and do real estate. Wow. So very, <laughs> very well-rounded sort of uh, journey you've had. You've, you've, you've been in different sort of niches, it sounds like. Um, so with, with these businesses that you, that you, that you owned, um, how, how did that happen to trans transition into, into real estate? What, what was sort of that, um, that sort of, uh, you know, change over? How did that change over? Sort of occur? Yeah, a good question. Um, so what, re I think the main goal was to have that home that I always wanted. And so, you know, as I even worked at the salon every day after work, I'd, you know, go online and look at these dream homes that I wanted. And when it came down to selling the salon, I actually had to work with a commercial agent to help me sell that salon. I tried to do it myself, but as people, you know, approach me, I didn't have the full confidence to, um, you know, make that transaction happen. Plus it was biased because I was selling it myself. Um, so I decided to utilize a real estate agent to help and, you know, pay the fees, get it done, get it sold, um, get it off my shoulders so I could move on to the next step. And, you know, I when I worked with that realtor, I was really impressed um, at the way he handled, you know, the, the transaction, the way I felt safe when, you know, he did showings, um, you know, because they're coming into your property. You kind of don't want your customers to know that you're selling. And, um, yeah, I, I really liked, enjoyed the process of that. And I'm like, you know what? I think I could do real estate. I had a little one um, that I was raising on my own. Um, she was uh, like eight months old. And so I took the real estate course while she was, uh, you know, studied while she was napping. And she only napped like one hour <laughs> for one hour. But I studied um, during that time um, for six months. I really just any time I had in between um, working at the salon, I just studied to make it happen. I researched more into real estate and um, I decided to uh, join Rennie and Associates Realty. Um, it was the first and only brokerage that I've been with and I've been there for not, uh, 10 years now. So fast forward into your real estate career, um, you know, how, how did you even go about getting started um, in, in, in sort of a brand new career um you know you were formerly owner of the, t the tang salon um what would you say was very key um like if you look back to your younger self like what do you think was very key to you getting getting going in real estate and and sort of building a successful career that you have now do, do you feel that your experience as a business owner really helped yes absolutely i would say two things um you know if you don't have pain, there's no gain. And if you don't um, fail, you'll never learn. And I felt like I failed. Um, I was so down. I didn't have the house I wanted. I wasn't where I wanted to be in my career. I didn't have that financial freedom that I was trying to strive for. Um, but I realized I was still, you know, still young, still learning. And um, I, I learned so many little factors from the tanning salon. You know, the marketing was on par. Uh, you wear many hats when you're uh, owning your own business. You know, working with your accountant to look at the numbers, training staff. Um, the one thing I overlooked was the location that we had. We're right on Hastings. And after a couple years of um, looking at each month and seeing the numbers and talking to our clients to see, you know, why they are coming in certain months and then certain months they're not, it was mainly because you drive by, you see customers driving by on Hastings, they look to see if there's parking. And when there's no parking, they drive to the next salon. <laughs> so they're, they're using two different salons just because it's, you know, after five o'clock, there's rush hour, you need to go wherever's convenient. And if there's no parking at ours, they're going to go to the next one. So yeah, that was something I overlooked. With real estate, I'm like, I, I know I can't make these mistakes. I want to really research how to zone into an area um, and, you know, be meticulous about doing that research um, this time. 
um, just not just for myself, but for my clients. So that was a big one that I learned from that, that I passed on to real estate. Everything else I felt was dialed, but um, learning that was really important. Um, and I wouldn't have, if I went into real estate without doing these other businesses, I wouldn't have, um, I feel like I wouldn't have been as successful. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Really sh- kind of showed some fundamental things to know, um, to, to sort of be successful in that new career, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. So with your um, services now, um, uh, do you work with both buyers and sellers? Like, how would you tell our listeners in, in terms of like um, what sort of services you provide? Yes. Um, I, you know, when you first go into real estate, you don't know what you're going to get. You're, you either strive to, initially I'm like, okay, I want to sell like luxury homes and be in these amazing homes and be able to, you know, help buyers and sellers get these homes. And, um, and it's so different. The first home I sold was a pre-sale, which, you know, you're selling a floor plan. Um, and I had no confidence on how to do that. Cause I didn't even think that that's what my first sale would be. Um, and so, yeah, I helped a buyer, um, get into a pre-sale. I actually worked, um, at the amazing Brentwood presentation center as a coordinator. And I actually didn't want to do that at first because, um, I wanted to just dive right into real estate. I was excited to sell the homes. And um, as a coordinator, you're doing, you know, going through the contracts, making sure there's no missing initials or missing items. You're um, greeting people at the front door. Um, there's uh, lots of conveyancing items you have to kind of learn and deal with. You got to make sure there's no mistakes. So there's a lot of pressure on that end. And, you know, admin is not my strong side. So it was it was a little bit of a challenge, but I had two of my um, strong like leaders and managers of that team that I worked on tell me if you don't start here you it's going to be so much harder to gain the success you want we all started here and this is why you know we're 10 years in and we have the ability to work on both sides of the market help buyers and sellers and have that confidence you're going to have it so much quicker if you do these things and that stuck. It actually humbled me because I realized when I did my other business, I was way over my head, um, you know, thought I could do it all, thought I had all this, you know, confidence to do it all and then realized I was wrong. So I'm so happy that I started, um, you know, started from the bottom. <laughs> now we're here um, and not even the bottom. Like you you got paid well for what you did and and actually helped because I needed the income on the side to, um, you know, before you made that first sale and the first pre-sale sale I made, you don't get paid until that building's built. So it was a struggle for sure. Yeah. So I, I guess it, it also taught you a lot of those skills that are like that lay the groundwork for, you know, being a, you know, an expert in, in uh, your field. Yes. Yeah. 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 Indeed. Looking at contracts, looking um, on a, uh, through all the different, the different processes that are involved. Yeah. So. Yeah. Cause you could have all the customer service. You could make sure your client feels comfortable with everything that they're buying. Um, you could know everything about the product, but then when you're going over that contract with the client, if you don't have that confidence of what each term means, how are they going to feel safe buying that home? How are they going to feel that they can trust you? So I'm so glad I learned all that groundwork because it actually took me a good year to feel comfortable even reading the contract to a client um, every time I, you know, it's almost like you have to keep practicing it um, because the questions that get thrown up at you aren't always easy. Right. Um, sometimes they'll be like, what's force majeure? And mm-hmm. I, you know, you can't, you can't bullshit it. Right. <laughs> right? So um, yeah. yeah, you have to really, really know your stuff and people right. appreciate that, you know, and they will call, call you out when, you know, you're making stuff up. So sure. <laughs> and I've, I've heard agents kind of like, oh, yeah, it, I, I'll look into that for you. Or it means this and it's not. You're listening to them. And so, right. yeah. And my thing is, is I want to make sure I know what I'm talking about. That's very important to me and that yes. my clients um, feel confident in the end. Right. So, so representing a buyer on the pre-sale or, you know, an existing property, um, do you, also, do you also work with sellers selling a property, uh, for them? Yes. And that's my favorite thing to do. 
I love to list homes, um, especially because of the marketing background that I have. I love um, looking at the, you know, making sure that the photos are dialed, um, you know, coordinating with all the trades, stagers, uh, videographers, drone footage um, to make sure that listing looks perfect on the market, better than the competition. Um, and I, I see, I get so much satisfaction out of seeing like how we sell a higher number than, you know, we break a record in the building. Um, and I always feel it's the marketing and it's the strategy. Um, so as I, you know, as the years went by into real estate, I would say my second year, I would be, I was working with more sellers. Um, and even now I feel like I'm more seller heavy than buyer heavy. I love working with buyers, but for some reason, uh, the business comes more as listings for me. Right. Yeah. So you mentioned staging. Yes. So, um, you know, at Milani's and Mora Group, very, very important uh, key component to our marketing. Yes. Yeah. How would you define staging and why is it so important to, to um, uh, a seller uh, to do that on their listing? Um, how would you define it? Because there's 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 a couple different ways to do it, and um, why does it bring the best results? I would say staged homes sell for ten percent more. I've done the research on our listings and compared it to our neighbors' listings, and on average, sometimes even more, sometimes a little less, but on average, ten percent more. Right. Yes. And is it? Uh... Is staging always about bringing in furniture um, or, or is it sometimes putting up decoration? What are the different ways and how, how, how can it uh, be sort of executed for the sellers? Okay. So, yeah, this is the one thing uh, where it's sometimes you mentioned that, you know, we should stage your home. And, you know, sometimes sellers feel a little bit com uncomfortable because it's their home. They don't want to be feeling like they're living in a hotel and, you know, having other items in their home and they have to declutter anyway but a lot of what we do is just decorative so our team will come in um amazing designers they'll see you know what you have um you know you have a gray couch um you have some let's say red pillows on it um that might not appeal to the big audience that we have um to real real our buyers in and so what they'll do is they'll look at you know the artwork that you have maybe they'll see that you you know, it's very empty in the home. They might need, want to fill it up, warm it up, make it cozy. Um, so they might utilize that one red pillow, um, take the rest of the red out just to tone it down a bit and add some neutral colors to it. And then they'll tie it in with pieces that you have in your home already. Um, a lot of the time they'll add some like green plants. Um, they'll add like a throw blanket um, just to make that, give it that warmth. Um, and it really is just stunning, you know, when we show our clients the before and afters of what they can do, just utilizing what they already have in the home or just bringing in some extra pieces, what a difference it makes. Right. So it sounds like all the little details matter. Would you agree? Yes, it absolutely does. I actually had a client make fun of it <laughs> saying um we had a perrier bottle in the kitchen so we filled um you know two they're empty perrier bottles you know um and we just filled it up with water and helped the stager do it um put it on the kitchen counter and the kitchen counter is very like we had to declutter it put some items in um some boxes we also give our stagers will give um the sellers a checklist of you know what to clear off the counter before they come in and um, yeah, we just decided to put uh, two Perrier bottles on the kitchen counter. Everything was very sleek, white, clean. And um, the seller came back and they loved the staging in all the rooms, all the bedrooms, everything that we did. And then he kind of just made fun of the fact that, okay, we, we cleaned our countertops, but these Perrier bottles are going to sell our home. And I'm, and I'm like, yes, actually, because what happens is, is it's not going to sell the home, but in the buyer's mind, um, there, and I went to school for marketing. Um, there's little things that people do in commercials. There's little things that people do in presentation centers to right. get that buyer excited. And it's more so like psychologically you think bubbles. So whether you drink beer, whether you drink bubbly, whether you drink any kind of like champagne, um, it puts in the mind of the buyer bubbles and it just gets them excited. 
And so that's why we put it there. And anyways, their home ended up selling for, there was two neighbors. It was us and another um, townhome selling in the complex. And we sold first and we sold a hundred thousand over out what the, um, the second property was listed for. So it's incredible. And it wasn't the period models. <laughs> I think it was our price strategy. It was the staging. It was our team. It was everything combined to get that excitement um, for that home. And, um, and it was also timing. So it's always, I feel, you know, seller might not feel comfortable having their home stage, but we, we make it comfortable. We'll even pay for it um, just, to, just to get the job done and um, get it done quickly so that we don't lose momentum on the market. Right. Um, the main thing is, is once a home goes stale on the market or it stays on the market, um, it gives that buyer leverage to maybe lowball on that property. And it just depends on whether that seller is going to take it or not. And that neighbor, unfortunately, took it. And we were the benchmark. They could have got higher. But anyway, right. it is what it is. <laughs> as long as we are doing the best for our clients, that's what really excites me. Yes. Yeah. Be honest, of course. And speaking of strategy, so you mentioned strategy earlier. Um, you know, this market needless to say has been a very tricky market um for this past uh you know year and a half what what's some advice you would give somebody that is selling or or buying even um uh in order to really best tackle the, this market because it seems that every neighborhood is different every product segment is different they all behave differently uh, in their own ways um What's, what's sort of your best advice for, for you know, somebody right now that was just starting out in, in, in their search or about to sell? I would say navigating buyers right now um, is so much fun because you can really negotiate and get a good deal on um, a home. I mean, we're seeing it on our listings where we're getting, you know, lowball offers, grind it. Um, and, you know, it's kind of like a numbers game, whether you know, the seller is okay with taking that or they want to just, you know, stay longer on the market. Um, and on the flip side, um, and also actually one thing to add for buyers is, you know, the uh, next interest rate announcement is going to come December 6th. So, uh, and inflation went down. So I think it's giving some buyers some confidence that either the interest rate might not change, maybe it'll go down, they can, you know, relock in their numbers. So I think it's good for buyers right now. On the flip side, um, sellers. So yeah, I mean, we've experienced it ourselves. Um, our sell, if the home is not priced sharp on the market, it's a little bit more challenging because we are getting those, you know, qualified buyers wanting to buy the home, but they're going out and comparing. They want the best specs that they are going to buy. And so, um, yeah, we're getting, you know, lower offers than expected, lower than, you know, what maybe you were seeing three months ago. And so it's, it's either, you know, if the seller's motivated, it's navigating them through the data, showing them what, all the stuff that we get from ready um, and to show, you know, where the numbers have changed, um, if they're getting lowballed or if they're getting actually a fair value for their home. Um, and it's again on us to uh, navigate them through s different strategies. So one of the list one of the recent listings we actually sold um, that one was a challenge. It actually took us four months to sell it, which the seller had time. They were, we were okay with that. So we tried, you know, listing it on the higher side, which was actually the right price, uh, that they could have got three months ago, um, if we listed it then, but not nobody's fault. The home was tenanted. So we had to go off that timing. Um, and then, you know, it just, we, we got a offer, but it was a low ball offer. So I told sellers, you know what, let's not take it. We have a story to tell the next uh, buyer, you know, you still have the ability to get more for your home. So let, if you have the time, let's try. And um, we did that. So, uh, it, you know, as we were getting offers, the offers were getting a little bit higher, but not where we needed to be for our sellers. And then uh, we had a team meeting, Valani's in our group. <laughs> um, and we basically discussed, you know, how can we sell this home for the price our sellers need? And we changed the strategy. And I was thinking, okay, let's change it to this strategy. And then Eric, you <laughs> came up with an, a more amazing idea. And 
we we decided to go with your strategy and it worked and um we actually got the highest offer we broke you know the building comps for its time and the sellers are so happy mm -hmm. so and and it took four months to achieve that but um sometimes you don't have to take um that first offer so we always say the first offer is the best offer but in this scenario i knew it wasn't the best offer i knew we could and i knew right. the time so i'm like we can get them more but we got to shift strategies um so it, i'm just so impressed with how how that one turned out and so are the sellers so um it's just more patience navigation and data right and just seeing what the competition is doing and how we can be better right do you find that um, communication is also very key to like um, sort of that that success at the end of it? Because you know you're sort of everybody's informed of what's going on, um, and and do you find that constant communication sort of helps to you know tweak where needed, uh, revise strategy where needed, and so on? Do you think that's like um, uh, a, a very big part of it? It's huge. I, yeah. you know, um, when I first started real estate, I didn't realize how much communication you really need in, in so many ways, whether it's with the other buyer's agent um, or whether it's with your sellers um, or your client. In this time that we're in uh, where there's a lot of uncertainty, um, things are changing by the week, interest rates are changing, you know, every couple of months. Um, our sell, I'm finding the sellers are, you know, they're wanting to get the reports the minute after you show that home. And, you know, sometimes I would give, you know, let's say, say when the market was hot, you would give weekly reports and sometimes you didn't even need to give a weekly report. The home so, so, just, you know, move very quickly off the market. But in this market where things are taking more time, I feel um, you really need to explain, you know, each client that comes in, you know, what their motivation is, how, you know, what their feedback was so that we can make appropriate changes um, and and documenting all that data so that, you know, week to week as the market's changing, you can see and remember, okay, um, this is what the market is saying. This is what, because as soon as you list a home, the market speaks and the buyers right now are dictating the market, I feel. So it's really just um, working together, getting that communication out daily if needed, um, to get, get that trust with your client so that they know it's not you, it's not the market, maybe it's the market, but you're, you're doing your best, um, to, to guide them through it and explain what's going on. Right. So we all don't have a crystal ball, but based on, you know, your experiences out in the field, um, how do you think this temperature that we're facing right now is is going to continue into next year um and and what's your what's your fun sort of uh prediction of, of how things are going to look next year oh god <laughs> okay well i would say um for next year i think it'll be more stable i think it'll be more balanced for it is my thought because we've gone through too much up and down this year and um you know i hope that inflation continues to come down um, I think the interest rate might either balance out or go a little lower. If it goes up, I don't know. It, it just doesn't make sense <laughs> if it goes up. Um, but I feel um, the buyers that have been sitting on the sidelines um, this year will realize that, you know, this is kind of what it is. Um, I don't see the rates going down to 2% again. Um, and, you know, these buyers, even my own clients, they are motivated to buy. So I think they'll come around. Um, and there's, you know, there's a lot of situational buys still happening, situation sells where, you know, somebody wants to downsize. Um, they, uh, you know, they bought something like a pre-sale investment. Um, maybe they have a few and they want to sell one and it gets that first, you know, it's an entry level price point where it gets that first time buyer into the market. So, and, and this year I saw, even with the ups and downs, buyers are still buying. I just feel like next year might be a little bit more balanced and people will be used to what's, what's happened um, and it will be the new norm. And, um, and then hopefully things, you know, continue to come down and, and they can, you know, re-lock in. Yeah. That's a very fair, yeah, fair assessment. Um, 
And how about you, like going forward? What what where, what do you see for yourself in terms of your your own goals? Um, you know, you're clearly a machine, um, always busy. Um, how do you stay motivated? And what like how, how do you keep yourself, you know, driving and striving for more? Right. Okay. I think um, the the first few things that I do daily really help keep me motivated. So um, it's going to the gym. Um, you know, it just gives me more energy throughout the day. It makes me sleep better at night. So I have the capacity to take on the work that I take on. Um, I do vision boards, um, you know, almost every two months. Right. Um, so that I can, you know, just achieve what I'm looking for. I, I put my goals down on Gafer and I actually map it all out on a big poster board. Uh, What's at the top of your vision board right now? The top of my vision board. <laughs> What's the biggest uh, image big. on there? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, sometimes it's a vacation that I want to take and I'm like striving, you know, this is it has to be done on the bucket list. So right. one of them was Greece. And when I put it on the board, I thought it wouldn't happen for a couple of years and it happened two months later. Um, you know, just clients that I want to help where it's like a, you know, a buyer that wants to get a certain property, but there's just not that inventory coming out for them. So I, I actually put it, I draw that home out. I don't personally draw that home, but I find a home like that online, print out that picture, put it on there and say, this buyer is getting this home this year, just to put channel that energy out there and it's worked. Um, and then on this flip side where I'm having challenging listings, you know, that are taking, and you know, as fast as we're used to selling, um, they're a little bit more of a challenge listing. I put those on there saying that they're sold and then they sell. <laughs> so it's always like these vision boards are always being updated because things are happening. And right. I feel like it just, it just keeps me motivated. Um, and lastly, just, you know, in the last couple of years, it kind of changed my diet in terms of what I'm eating. And I find um, doing that, it actually gave me more energy. Um, you know, I've kept my mind um, more dialed and, and um, just remembering things better. And um, yeah, I think that that's been helpful as well. Wow. Yeah. That is awesome. Okay. Well, lastly, I wanted to ask any favorite listing right now that you want to you want to shout out favorite listing so <laughs> I, we have a listing in uh, north van um on wellington it's a beautiful uh detached home it's got a um, assumable interest rate of 1.64 percent up until wow yeah. did you say one one <laughs> yes, and most people's mortgages are not assumable so, okay. Uh, this is through RBC. Um, the you know seller doesn't have to do this, but it's such a good rate. They're so excited about it and happy for a new buyer to you know assume that. And it's till November two thousand twenty five, so it's for two years. Wow. Um. So I think that could save a buyer a lot of money. Um. And it's a great home. It's a little bit difficult to show. It's tenanted um, by two different tenants, so there's a top and a bottom. So coordinating. That is a little bit of a challenge, but um, yeah, that one we are really excited to sell. Wow. Okay. So you heard it here. 1.64%. Did I get that number right? Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. So I just wanted to say a sincere thank you for being here. Um, you know, we've been trying to do this for a while now. And, um, you know, I just want you to know I'm always constantly learning from you. Um, you inspire us all the time with your ideas and your work ethic and uh just want to say congratulations on all of your success oh my gosh thank you so much for having me and for yeah. all the kind words i'm so lucky to have you as well in my life and <clears throat> all of you that are on our team so thank you for keeping me motivated and keeping the drive going and keeping the machine going let's do it okay thank you for being here <laughs> okay thanks shelly